بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم So we're on chapter 21 in the greater sins. Um, this greater sin is non-fulfillment of a promise. He says the 21st of the greater sins is breaking of a promise. There are authentic traditions to this effect from uh, Shah Abdul Hadim, where he quotes Imam Sadiq salam, has proved it to be a greater sin with the help of the following verse of Quran. And those who break their covenant of Allah after its confirmation and cut asunder that which Allah has been ordered to join and make mischief in the land, as for those upon them shall be the curse and they shall have an evil abode. So uh, it's talking here, those who break their covenant, you make a promise and then you uh, break that promise and you cut asunder what Allah uh, ordered to be joined and they make mischief in the land. Uh, you know, this uh, verse always reminds me of uh, Qum. Uh, we have 120,000 people in Ghadir Qum, and Prophet says, Sallallahu says, Man kuntum Allah fahada Ali and Mawla, and Allah enjoined for us to follow the Imam and obey the Prophet in this, which is command from Allah. But people broke their covenant and they cut asunder what Allah order them to join and made mischief in the land and now we are involved in big fitna all the way till today because they abandoned uh walayat of amir al-mu'mineen ali ibn abi talib salam this is one promise because they promised with the prophet to do this and then they broke this promise this is one type of promise we also have promises between us and allah between us and other people, and this encompasses a lot of different things. It says, Holy Quran denounces the breaking of a promise in the following ayat to uh, whoever fulfills his promise and guards against evil, then surely Allah loves those who guard against evil. As for those who take a small price for the covenant of Allah and their own oaths, surely they shall have no portion in the hereafter. And Allah will not speak to them, nor will he look upon them on the day of resurrection, nor will he purify them, and they shall have a painful chastisement. This is Surah Ali Imran, Ayat 77. Other verse, Surah Anfal, Ayat 55. Surely the vilest of animals in Allah's sight are those who disbelieve, and they then they would not believe. And he brings the next verse. Those whom, with whom you made an agreement, and then they break their agreement every time and they do not guard against punishment. So Allah condemns this, breaking the agreements. He said this ayat is critical of the Jews of Bani Qurayza. They didn't honor their covenant and that they made with the Prophet, and uh, they chose to cooperate with the idol worshipers. So they supplied arms to the disbelievers in Mecca in the Battle of Badr. And Sheikh, they, can you excuse me? I, I missed that last one. What 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 surah was that, and what uh, ayat was that last two? Surah eight, ayat eight. fifty-five and fifty-six. Fifty-five and fifty-six. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So the Jews, they uh, said that they would support the prophet, but then they were sneaking weapons to the idol worshippers through the back door. <clears throat> so uh, they broke their covenant. Later, they justified their actions saying they had forgotten about it. They, you know, they got under pressure. They said, oh, we forgot. And they entered into another agreement with the prophet only to break that agreement too um, at the Battle of Khandak, or the Battle of Trench. And they went with Abu Sufyan and they broke the covenant with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. In, he says, uh, in different places in the Quran, we see that fulfilling a promise has been made wajib and highly emphasized. For example, Surah 17, Ayah 34. And fulfill the promise, surely every promise shall be questioned about. Also, Surah Ma'ada, Ayah 1. O you who believe, fulfill your obligations. It says, Ya ayyuhaladheena amanu awfu bil-uqud. 
So when we look at obligations and covenants, firstly, we have the covenant we made with our creator when we accepted the path of Islam. Uh, some people convert to Islam. Some people are born as a Muslim, but there comes a time when they accept this as the truth and they accept that they want to follow this and they stop emulating their parents and they come to a conscious decision that they are Muslim. This is a type of covenant we have with Allah that we will, you know, as Allah says, Allah wa rusul wa ulul amr minkum. Uh, in Surah 4, Ayat 59, Allah says to obey Allah, obey the messenger and those in authority amongst you, the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam. So we have to stay truthful to our covenant. We made to follow the guidance of Quran um, <clears throat> and Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam, the thakalain, the two weighty things. We shouldn't be like that man mentioned in the Quran who was on that boat and he was surrounded by the storm. He called out to Allah to save him. And then uh, when, you know, he said, oh, Allah, basically like, oh, Allah, I'll do the right thing. If you get me out of this jam, you know, save me from this uh, storm. And then, you know, when he got to land, he forgot all about the promise. This is in, mentioned in Surah Yunus, Ayat 22 and 23, where Allah says, when you are in the ships and they sail along with them with a favorable wind exulting in it, there comes upon them a turbulent wind and waves assail them from every side, and they think that they are besieged. They invoke Allah, putting exclusive faith in him. If you deliver us from this, we will surely be amongst the grateful. But when he delivers them, behold, they commit violations on the earth unduly. O oh, mankind, your violations are only to your own detriment. So we find ourselves surrounded by problems that can be likened to this storm. And we call out on Allah to help us in this situation. You know, the question is when Allah, you know, gives us what we asked for, whether some people, they ask for their freedom, some people ask for overcome sickness or some extreme hajat that they have. And, you know, whatever problem they're facing, when Allah solves that problem for them, will they go right back to the things they used to do, neglecting Allah and forgetting the promise? And we have to honor this covenant that we have made with Allah and uphold our religious duties, our wajibat, and uh, by following the Quran and the Holy Prophet to the best of our abilities. So we have to remember, you know, uh, all of the things that Allah has done for us that we should fulfill our obligations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this covenant that we have made with him. Uh, <clears throat> he says in Surah Baqarah, Ayat 177, and the performers of their promise when they make a promise. Also in Surah 61, Ayat 2 and 3, O you who believe, why do you say that, will you, that which you do not do? It's most hateful to Allah that you should say what you don't do. So if we promise something, we should fulfill our promise. We should be, as they say, a man of our word and, you know, do it. Even if we incur some loss, we should still fulfill our promises. Imam Sadiq, alayhi salam, he explained this ayat. He says, a believer's promise to his believing brother is a vow that has no expiation, meaning it cannot be broken. But one who goes back on his word declares his opposition and enmity to Allah and invokes the anger of Allah. So we have to be careful how many times we promise stuff to people, but we, from the very beginning, we don't even intend to do it. We say, oh, yeah, yeah, I promise I'll do this or I'll do that, but we have no intention of doing that. We should just be honest and say, you know, I will try or I don't know, maybe we'll see or um, I cannot, you know, or whatever the case is. We shouldn't uh, lie and make promises because people could be counting on us and then we let them down. This also ruptures relations between um, brothers. This can also uh, rupture relations in communities. We see this also with politicians. They promise many things, but when they and they say, oh, just elect me and I'll do this and that and this other thing. And when they get there, they forget all about everyone. This is why politicians, one of the reasons they have a very bad reputation. <clears throat> Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, uh, he's giving advice to Malik al-Ashtar. He says, 
breaking a promise causes the anger of Allah. Also, uh, he quotes this uh, same verse that we mentioned. Imam Bakr alayhi salam, he says, there are four types of sinners who are punished very soon. The person who violates the pact he has made with you, even though you have respected it. So you honored your side, but they broke their end of the deal. The one who inflicts harm upon you, even though you caused him no harm. One who has promised you something and you are faithful upon your agreement, but he is unfaithful. One who wants to sever the relations, even though the relative wishes to continue the relationship. So these sins, um, these violations, they bring about wrath of Allah almost uh, immediately. They come very quickly. It's not saved for a later time. Uh, Abu Malik asked Imam Zain al-Abadin alayhi salam, he says, inform me about all the rules of religion. The Imam told him to speak the truth, to judge with justice, and to fulfill the promise. So these are some of the main uh, conditions that we must have, um, you know, to have the, to implement the religion. We need to speak the truth. We shouldn't deal with falsehood. We need to deal with justice. We uh, should not deal, you know, unjustly with people. And we need to fulfill our promises to other people that we make. Imam Sadiq, alayhi salam, he said, he whoever has three characteristics is certainly a munafiq, a hypocrite, even if he prays and he fasts. The one who lies when he speaks, the one who breaks his promises and violates the trusts. So these three things, even if they pray and fast, they will have uh, hypocrisy. You know, these are signs of being a hypocrite. So we see that violating the trust is one of those things on that list and breaking the promises. So not fulfilling the trust and also breaking promises is a sign of hypocrisy. This also brings destruction to a person's life, actually. Uh, Imam Ali, alayhi salam, he says, if one of four things enters uh, a house, it ruins that house and deprives it of prosperity and blessings. The one is breach of trust, theft, drinking wine, and uh, immorality. So we see breach of trust. Breach of a trust is a type of promise. You they give you something and you say, I will take care of this thing, and you break it. You break the trust. Either you mishandle the uh, funds or the item that was given to you, you don't take care of it, or you lose it, or it gets broken, and these type of things. All of these things, when we do them, it, it's a sign of hypocrisy. Also, it brings about destruction to our homes. So a lot of times, people wonder why they go through a lot of problems, even though they are praying and they are fasting, but many times they are doing a lot of other things that are um, causing problems. It says, although a vast majority of traditions and ayats denounce the breaking of promises, we'll only quote uh, a few of them. <clears throat> there, we have a lot of narrations in regards to this. So it would probably take a whole book to cover these type of narrations and the emphasis that was laid on fulfilling the promises and the trusts. He said, there are three types of promises. The promise of Allah to his creatures, promise of the creatures to Allah, and pro promises of people amongst themselves. So the first one, the promise of Allah to his creatures, is that of Alamadar. Alamadar is the world of the particles, or the spiritual plane before this existence that we had. He um, says, we come to know of this promise through Quranic ayats, as well as narrations. According to this, Allah first created the souls of all human beings and made the following covenant, that they remain on the right path. They don't associate anyone or anything with Allah. They obey the commands of their prophet and do not follow shaitan. Allah shall recompense them by helping them, by keeping them forever in his mercy and give them a place in paradise. But if they do, if they do not respect their covenant, Allah will also disregard his side of the promise it is for this fact that Allah says in Surah Baqarah, Ayat 40, and be faithful to your covenant with me, I will fulfill my covenant with you. Also in Surah 36, Ayat 60, did I not charge you, O children of Adam, that you should not serve shaitan? 
So the covenant of, that Allah took with the people in Alamadar also includes the walayat of Ahlul Bayt salam, and specifically Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. Um, a lot of narrations speak about this uh, fact, and we also have it uh, recorded in different heavenly scriptures. He says, and all the prophets have conveyed the message of walayat of the 14 Masumin. Uh, we uh, we have um, many narrations about this, about the prophets when they received their prophethood. They got it because they accepted the walayat of Amir al Mumineen and the A'imma alayhi salam. And um, for example, one comes to mind about Adam alayhi salam when he noticed these uh, lights. This is in Sunni narrations as well as Shia. He noticed these lights, but they were in the shape of him, like something similar to him, like human. He asked Allah, what are these lights? And Allah taught him the names of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam. And he asked the angels to inform Adam, you know, what is the name of these lights? And the angels did not know. So Allah told Adam to inform them of the names. Adam informed them of the names. And Allah put this nur <coughs> in the... Uh, sulb or the uh, loins or the backbone of uh, Adam alayhi salam and this light carried from prophet to prophet and through pure uh, loins and pure wombs so <clears throat> due to this knowledge and this accepting of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam Allah ordered the angels to bow down to Adam out of respect for carrying this nur of Ahlul Bayt or this light and this knowledge of Ahlul Bayt alayhi <clears throat> wasalam. Uh, he says, um, let's see. And he says, whether a man breaks the promise given in Alamadar or goes against his innate nature, he commits a greater sin. This fact has been emphasized in most ayats and traditions, and it is confirmed that honoring the covenant is wajib and not respecting it is haram. It is also confirmed that the breaking of this first covenant can bring severe chastisement. The people are also warned of dire consequences in case of default. The traditions also inform us that serious retribution incurred just for violating the first covenant, which is the greatest of the sins. Hence, it is incumbent upon the people to fulfill their covenant so that Allah may fulfill his promise. For example, of the one who broke his covenant, uh, we can look at Iblis. Iblis broke his covenant with Adam. Uh, with, uh, with, he didn't want to submit to Adam. The one Allah chose as Khalifatullah, the, the guardian or successor in the earth. The one Allah has appointed to rule in the earth, the Khalifa. So he was the Khalifa of his time. And, uh, so when Allah enjoined uh, Iblis to bow down to him, he didn't because he was proud. And he rejected the messenger of his time, the one who Allah appointed during his time. So when he rejected the, the covenant Allah asked him to fulfill, we see what happened after this. He is termed as shaitan and he is outcast and he is cursed. So we have this in our fitra that we should, we know about this from Alamadar. And sometime in someone's life, they come to ask themselves about believing in Allah. And then they learn about religions and they come to know about believing in the messenger. And it's up to them if they honor their covenant or they accept it or they reject it. And the same thing with Walayat. Walayat is um, something very easy to accept, but unfortunately not many accept it. They say that the prophet left everything for chance, but there is no way the prophet worked this hard and just left it for chance. And we have many narrations, like I said about Gaidar Qum and other things where the prophet asked for pen and paper and they said, oh, we don't need this. Uh, prophet is delirious, na'udhu billah, and he is speaking out of his mind, astaghfirullah. And that they said the book of Allah is sufficient for us. Basically, we don't need anything from you anymore. Uh, you can go and we just take the book of Allah. But they, when we look at this, right, <clears throat> I'll give an example. Uh, some person uh, is in masjid 
and he is praying like a Shia. So Wahhabi person sees him and he says, you know, uh, how come you do this and you pray like that and you join your prayer, Maghrib and Isha, and you pray with Turba and you pray with your hand down and on and on and on. And he wants to argue and debate with the guy. And the guy says, okay, you know, uh, where shall we meet? And the guy says, you know, uh, come to my um, bookstore. So he goes to the bookstore. And the guy owns, the Wahhabi guy owns bookstore. And he says, you know, okay, uh, I will debate you right now. But one condition that we have to leave here and go to Masjid Nabawi. They were in Medina. He said, I'll go to debate you in Masjid Nabawi right now. But you have to leave your shop. The guy said, oh, no, I can't go right now because I need to look after my books and my shop and who's going to manage my store while I'm gone, who's going to take care of the sales and watch my uh, books. You know, someone, you know, uh, could come and take them or something like this. So the guy said, oh, if you're worried about these couple books that you have in your shop and your small business and you don't want to leave it unattended without appointing someone to watch over it, how come you can think that? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi worked for these 23 years establishing the religion of Allah on the earth and you think that he is going to just leave it for, for a chance you know and you, you won't even leave your own few books you have here so this walayat and continuation of a message by someone protecting the message is logical it's a, a akli you know we have a intellectual reasoning for this everyone would accept this but for some reason, some people think that the Prophet just left it and let community deal with it and this and that. So, and even we see that a lot of Sahaba did not even accept this and that there was a big fitna after uh, this. So everyone has these uh, reasonings inside them from their fitra and they will think about them. Even the people who have accepted uh, Allah and his Prophet, they will come to think about walayat. And they took the oh Allah told them this and Allah Madar, it is up to them if they honor this covenant in this life or they break this covenant or not. <clears throat> he says one of the promises of Allah to his creatures is that he will answer every prayer. But this is only on condition that the supplicant honors this covenant with Allah. So we cannot break all the rules, we break all the covenants with Allah, and we do all all the haram things, and then we say, Ya Allah, I need this. Ya Allah, give me that. <laughs> help me with my job, or help me this, or get a spouse, or this thing, or that thing. And then we expect Allah to give it to us. And we break all the rules. Uh, it's like, you know, the child is misbehaving, and uh, he's doing everything he, his parents tell him not to do. And then the child says, oh, uh, you know, I want a piece of candy. The parents are going to say, no way, because you're not listening, you're not obeying, you're not fulfilling you know, all the rules I told you to, and you broke every single rule, and you don't listen to me. And the parent won't give him anything. This is similar, you know, so we can understand uh, better. But we ask Allah for all sort of things, but do we pray, or do we fast, or do we honor the promises, or do we, you know, do we fulfill all the things he asks us to do? Do we stay away from the things Allah asked us to stay away from? So we have to think about that. It says, uh, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, when a man prays to Allah with a pure intention and a sincere heart, Allah answers his dua after the man has fulfilled his promise to Allah. But if man prays to Allah without a pure intention and without sincerity, and Allah does not answer it, has not Allah said in Quran and Surah Baqarah, ayat 40, and be faithful to your covenant with me, and I will fulfill my covenant with you. So the promise is kept only with the one who keeps his own word. He keeps his promise. So we need to keep our end of the deal, and then we can expect Allah to give us uh, from his mercy and from his bounty and increase our sustenance and these things. But if we are not fulfilling our end of the bargain, how can we expect Allah to continue increasing our sustenance and our blessings and to keep calamities away from us? And this We see in Dua Kumail uh, many verses uh, or lines from this Dua. Oh Allah, forgive me 
from those sins that bring about your punishment and bring about your uh, trial, bring about trials and these type of things. So sins that we do can bring bad things to us and it can cause the uh, Oh Allah, for, forgive me for the sins that block the dua. So a lot of time we're asking Allah to show us the way, but we are in the way. We are blocking our own way. There's a beautiful narration. Uh, it says, uh, Imam Sadiq salam, said, and uh, a man from Bani, Bani Israel asked Allah for 33 years to give him a child. Then when he realized that Allah didn't answer him, he said, Ya Allah, am I far away from you that you cannot hear me? Or are you close and you just choose not to answer me? The man is frustrated, you know, he's asking for 33 years persistently. So a man came to him in his dream and said to him, you ask Allah with a hideous tongue. You ask uh, Allah with a hardened and cruel and impure heart and a flawed and bad intention. So repent from your vulgarity. Let your heart fear Allah. Refine your intention. He said, so the man, Imam said, the man, the man did this, and then he asked Allah, and he was granted a son. So we see the reason why his dua was blocked for 33 years is his own self. He was had bad intention. He uh, has a bad tongue. He has a hard heart. So a lot of times we have to look in ourselves and we find our flaws and work on these flaws and ask Allah to forgive us for these things and the things that we don't even know about. Maybe we're doing things that we don't even know are, are bad and are blocking us. So we ask Allah to forgive us for those things too and make us aware of those things so we can uh, fix them, inshallah. He said the second type of promise is that the man gives to Allah, like a vow or an oath, says for an oath to be binding, it's necessary that it is expressed verbally, not something in your mind. Says, for example, if someone wants to vow to Allah and state and state it in Arabic language, he should say, Ahad to Allah, uh, like I have vowed to Allah, or I have made an, a covenant with Allah. Or, uh, for example, they make uh, a covenant, Lillahi uh, alayya, they make it binding on them. Uh, uh, for this thing that they want to do. Uh, we've talked about these things before, covenant, oath, and uh, swearing, the ahad, nadar, and uh, yamin, or qasam, half, they go by these. This last one, the swearing goes by three different words that are used interchangeably. Uh, yamin, qasam, half. It's like saying wallahi. Or uh, wa Rahman or uh, wa Lati for swearing by Allah's names. He said the statement of promise, oath, or the vow can be in any language, but it, it must be expressed verbally. A vow, for example, may consist of saying, If I return safe and sound from the journey, I will give such and such charity in the way of Allah. If an oath is intended mentally and not expressed verbally, it's not binding, shar'an like uh, by the Islamic law. And also we mentioned this before, it's like a youth who gives a, uh, makes an oath or a vow, but he didn't have his father's approval, then the oath is not binding. Or someone swears by masumin, and it's not by the name of Allah, it is not binding on them. And many other of these conditions, we already talked about it before, so no need to uh, be redundant and go over all those things again. Because I remember it was quite lengthy we talked about. He says, it must be remembered that a vow, oath, or a promise should not be taken for a useless object. That is, the object must not be undesirable from the Islamic point of view. An oath taken to carry out some makru or haram action, a vow to abstain from a wajib or a mustahab act is invalid. So the vow is not binding. The vow actually was never uh, valid in the first place. Like a person who says, uh, if Allah saves me from this, then I will drink one cup of wine or something like this, uh, do something haram. The, both, the oath is not, uh, is not valid in the first place. 
an oath taken for an action which is wajib and its avoidance is haram in a prevailing set of conditions automatically becomes valid if the conditions change. For example, a man vows to give $1,000 in charity if he gets well. But after he is well, he becomes so poor that it is hardly possible for him to maintain his family. In these circumstances, the vow is considered invalid and it is not wajib to him for him to fulfill it. So the conditions changed. And in that case, uh, he is not uh, liable for that anymore. <clears throat> he says, uh, in conclusion, it can be said that an oath should be taken if it is acceptable from the religious point of view. In any case, an oath should be taken when common sense dictates that the oath serves some useful purpose, either by carrying out an action or by abstaining from it. For example, to walk and exercise, which are beneficent and uh, permitted, and to abstain from uh, smoking, which is harmful to the health, although it is mobah. So, um, uh, someone can say, for example, they will not, uh, if such and such happens, I will not smoke anymore. And, uh, you know, this this type of thing. Make a, uh, another, an oath. <clears throat> uh, let's see here, the next part. Just as in the case of an oath or vow, a covenant uh, is is also neither, is either conditional or absolute. An example of an absolute covenant is when a man says, I make a covenant with Allah, I will perform such and such good action. Then this thing shall be binding on him. Uh, if he does not do so, he would have committed a greater sin. Uh, okay. In addition, he also has to pay the penalty. The covenant is, is the one when the person attaches some conditions. For example, he may say, so the first one is a ah is an oath, uh, not a vow. An oath it just says, "I swear by Allah, I will do such and such." It's one sided. It's between him and Allah. It's between him. It's just for himself, but uh, for Allah, he is saying, "I swear by Allah, I will whatever fast next Thursday or something." It becomes wajib on him at that point to do that, and he has to do that. If he doesn't do it, he has to do uh, kafara. Also, the vow, the vow is two-sided between the person and Allah. It takes two things. So they are saying that, oh Allah, if you give me this, I will do this. Or, oh Allah, if you give me this, I will refrain from such and such a thing. So he says, for example, if Allah gives me a son, I will perform such and such good deed. Then that good deed becomes wajib on him only when he gets the son. So when the condition is fulfilled, Allah gives him what he asked for, then whatever he said he was going to do becomes wajib on him at that time. Once the condition is fulfilled, it will also become haram for him to leave the deed undone, and he will have to pay uh, additional uh, penalty if he does not do this. He is liable, liable for something if he breaks this uh, condition, this oath. <clears throat> Uh, we'll talk about it in a, in a minute. He says, actually, a vow and an oath, or a uh, nadar and ahad, is also a covenant with Allah Almighty. Therefore, a covenant is of three types. One is the covenant itself, and the other two, uh, one is a vow, and the other is an oath. Uh, as we mentioned, ahad is a covenant, uh, nadar is a vow. And yamin is a type of swearing that you will do something where he, he says here as an oath, what, like, wallahi, I will do such and such. It's only due to divine mercy that man is given a choice of three kinds of covenants in case he wishes to avoid the risk of being liable for keeping 60 fasts. Like, uh, like uh, for example, when we break the fast of month of Ramadan intentionally, we have to do 60 fast or feed uh, 60 uh, poor people. So he can make a uh, vow or take an Islamic oath. So, um, for example, the Ahad, uh, it will say it here, breaking of a covenant, whether absolute or conditional, is haram, 
an ahad, a, a covenant. You say that I I uh, make a covenant with Allah, ahad to Allah, that I will do such and such, or I will refrain from such and such. Uh, whether it is absolute or it's conditional, these both of these are haram. And the expiation or kafara is wajib if they break this. It's the same as breaking or omitting without any reason a, a fast of Ramadan. So feeding 60 poor people or keeping 60 day consecutive fast or freeing a slave, which is no longer applicable in this time. And if that person is, uh, you know, unable to fulfill either of these two expiation options, feeding uh, 60 poor people or keeping 60 day fast, then they should fast 18 days. Uh, further, if the person is not even able to do that, then he should ask Allah for forgiveness, and this will be enough. This is for breaking an ahd. Ahd is a covenant, not a vow. Another is saying, uh, if Allah does this for me, I will do something, you know, or I will refrain from something. Ahd is just one-sided, that you vow to Allah that you will do such and such. Like, for example, you say, I vow to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that I will go to Ziyarat Arba'in this year. And you don't go, just choose not to do something. And then you have, this is an ahd and you have to uh, give kafara, which is same as breaking a fast in month of Ramadan, feeding 60 poor people or completing 60 day fast. If you cannot do that uh, in the book, uh, expiation or kafara from Sayyid Sistani, he says that you can fast 18 days. And if you cannot do that, then just do tawbah. Chef, can I ask you a question on that? 60, you said 60 consecutive days. I thought about 31 consecutive days in the next 30 or yeah, next they, they are they, they are called uh, termed 60 consecutive days, but you are correct. It needs to be 31. And then the other uh, 29 you can make on and off whenever you want. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's 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 called uh two consecutive months. And I guess is a better word than 60 days, as he mentioned in the book. Uh, it should be two consecutive months. So they one month complete and then uh, uh, one day from the other month. Correct. Thank uh, you. Uh, yeah. Awesome. He says, if a vow, or a, this is for Ahd. So now, another, uh, and we'll finish with this uh, part. Uh, if another is broken, saying that, oh, Allah, if you give me such and such, I will do such and such, this two-sided thing. Uh, if this is broken, uh, it's the same as that of uh, breaking an oath. That is, an oath is saying, wallahi, I will do such and such, called uh, yameen or qasam or half. That is feeding or clothing 10 poor people. Uh, or freeing a slave, which is not applicable, but we should mention it. But if he cannot do any of these, then it is wajib for him to keep at least three fasts. Uh, this is for nadr and yameen. So the one who says, um, uh, uh, like uh, upon me, you know, uh, for Allah is, uh, if, if Allah, you give me a son, I will go to Ziyarat Arba'in this year or something like that. And Allah gives you the child and you don't go to Ziyar Arba'in and then you made another. So in this case, uh, it was conditional. The first one, when we said, ah, you just said by yourself, Allah, I vow that I will go to Arba'in this year. You made it wajib on yourself, but it wasn't conditional on Allah giving you something. So that is Ahd, and that requires the two consecutive month fast for kafara or feeding 64 people, as we said. The another is conditional. Allah gives you something, and you say that hey, he gives you a son. I will go to uh, Ziyar Arba'in this year. And Allah gives you the son, but you don't go to the Ziyarat. You broke the another, the vow that you made. In this case, it is uh, feeding 10 poor people or clothing 10 poor people or if we cannot do this then we need to fast for three days and the same is for uh someone who says wallahi i will uh, do such and such or what you know uh, wallahi i will abstain from such and such like the person says wallahi i will stop i will i will not smoke another cigarette for example 
and then they break down and they smoke the uh, they smoke their cigarette. They broke their uh, their oath, their swearing, which is uh, we call uh, uh, yamin, kasam, or half. All these three words mean the same. Mostly we use like either yamin or uh, kasam. So it's just swearing. Wallahi, or you swear, but it has conditions. It has to be by Allah's name, for example, or one of his attributes. And we talked a lot about this before. But in this case, the kafara for this is the same as another. They need to uh, feed 10 poor people or clothe 10 poor people or with the same type of stuff that they would, uh, you know, use. Uh, for example, they eat uh, this type of uh, grade of food. They should feed them the same, not give them some, you know, very small or, or not so nice food or the same clothes that we would wear not uh, something that uh, is from the secondhand thrift store or something like this. And if we can't do this, then we should fast for three days. So can this, this is, happen? Uh, can this happen anywhere? I mean, can you feed people in back home or uh, clothe them in, in Pakistan as opposed to U U.S. because if you don't know anybody here? Uh, most of the time when it comes to, um, I have to check for this specific thing. But for say, example, uh, Zakat of Fitr and uh, yeah. other uh, other charity, we should use it in the place we're at. But if we do not find anyone here, then it needs to go elsewhere. So uh, I'm not sure in this case whether it matters if it is here or the other place. But as a precaution, I would try to find some poor uh, person here, some poor uh, Shia, and then give that to them. And if we cannot find anywhere, then we give it to the other places. But can that be an excuse for fasting <laughs> as opposed to giving 10, feeding 10 people because you cannot find anybody or just because you cannot afford it? That's the criteria. It's if you cannot, uh, if you cannot do it, like you can, I think it would be if you could not afford it, like afford you're not it. able to do it. Yeah, because it's better to do these, but if you cannot afford it, maybe you're like paycheck to paycheck and you cannot, um, you know, do that, then um, the person needs to do something. So you don't need any money to fast. So the person will fast in that case. The, the reason I asked that question is we have encountered this problem here. Even last uh, Ramadan, uh, the Eid al-Fitr, we collected the money to give it locally, but we did not find anybody here. So finally you had to, You know, well, a lot of time well, we think about the poor person as being like uh, homeless or something like this, but the poor person is the person who cannot meet his needs for the year. Exactly. Like, that's uh, that's the struggling criteria. And he's just barely getting by and he doesn't really have sufficient uh, money to to pay all his bills. You know, he could be in debts and other things and he cannot, you know, barely maintain any of this stuff. And he's always falling behind with other things you know so yeah, unfortunately we don't may seem hear like on, they may seem like uh okay on the out on the surface but maybe they are going through a lot of stuff or they're unemployed or other things but most of the time to free yourself from that obligation of looking for someone i would give it to the office of the marja and let them take care of it that way you've fulfilled your obligation and they have the duty of distributing that money okay Because I yeah. know uh, most people who are in that condition will not reveal their, you know, their yeah. predicament, their problem. So, yeah, sometimes uh, they don't want to take it either. Yeah, exactly. Even I had uh, some Saham Sadat money. It was not much, but uh, I knew some say they're unemployed and they needed, they need it, but no, I don't want to give it to the next uh, person. They probably need it more than me. And it, this went on a few times and no one would uh, take it. So I ended up having to give it to the office and let them deal with it. I see. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, best is probably, you know, give it to one of these big organizations. For, for, for example, Imam. Im, Imam has options and you can select on their website. This is for this or that or, you know, this, this sort of thing or somewhere like uh, maybe like Sabo Center in California. They have options for these things, too, on their website and let someone else distribute it. it it'd be much easier. 
I can understand Fitria being um, in a time constraint. It's really the day or the Eid and all that. What, what about the Oath or another or Ahad? Is that time constraint too, that you have to feed 10 people within a certain time frame or can you spread it out over the year? Uh, no, it's just on, it's liable on you until you fulfill it. So it could be done in one month or five months, whatever. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's like, uh, we could say like it's on your neck until you, you know, until fulfill you remove it, it until, you, until you fulfill that. It's an okay. uh, obligation on you until you finish it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Take a break? Yeah, we should uh, end here and um, take a break and then come back for the other one, inshallah. Okay. Salaam Muhammad wa Muhammad. Allahumma.